a presentation can either take the form of an analysis of something specific, or something more general, trying to connect many themes. I've chosen the second option today with the risk that my presentation will be somewhat hasty and that several points or arguments will be implicit, but we can hopefully discuss the argument afterwards. The point of departure is the necessity of a critique of the concept of the Euro-modernist avant-garde, or more precisely, critique of the analysis of the historical development of the artistic avant-garde. The goal being to come up with a new understanding of the avant-garde after the end of the avant-garde. The obvious difficulty has to do with the fact that any more coherent use of the notion of avant-garde would locate it in the past. I fully concur with that, but we'll try to displace the inevitable, the end of the avant-garde, and point towards something we could perhaps tentatively call an after-avant-garde. An after-avant-garde with its back turned towards the future, an active outside art. But I start with the present state of the analysis of the avant-garde. The dominant reading of the trajectory of the avant-garde argues that the avant-garde disappeared either with World War II or at least in the 1960s. So this is, this is also related to the question of, that was raised before the break, the question of when did the crisis actually occur. Uh, I mean, so the argument that, that for instance, the financial crisis, which turned into a, an economic crisis, which turned into a political crisis, is of course intimately connected to what we, with a shorthand, call neoliberal globalization, which was in itself uh, a kind of unstable crisis solution. So, at least as early as the, as, uh, as the, the early 1970s, the crisis, in a certain sense, set in. Um, but this, the analysis of, of, uh, of the end of the avant-garde comes in two different versions, in two variants. One that takes this to be a good thing, and one that laments the disappearance of the avant-garde. The first version comes in a conservative and a left-leaning version. And this is perhaps also, I like the whole question of, of, of language or vocabulary, of course also has to do with the uh, relevance or, or, or not of, of terms like uh, the left, for instance. But uh, in the lack of, of best descriptions, um, I'll also use them in, in this presentation. The conservative version of the conservative position uh, that applauds the end of the avant-garde is only too happy to get rid of the avant-garde and its irresponsible ridiculing of the tradition of art and of European civilization. That critique is, is, is less relevant, so I'll just skip it. The left-leaning version critiques the avant-garde for its grand iconoclastic gestures. In her influential 1981 article, The Originality of the Avant-Garde, Former Kim Green, pupil U.S. art historian and editor of October, Rosalind Krauss, wrote that, I quote, the historical period that the avant-garde shared with modernism is over. That seems an obvious fact. The avant-garde, according to Krauss, was characterized by a problematic notion of originality, hence the title. Krauss argued that in a deconstructivist gesture. Krauss's goodbye to the avant-garde was part of a defense for what she herself termed, at that time, postmodernist art, exemplified by Sherry Levine in the article. Postmodernist art, and Krauss's own postmodernist art critique, we might note, were demystifying the avant-garde's idea of authenticity, showing the fictitious condition of the origin, that original and copy cannot easily be separated. The lament of the avant-garde is perhaps best represented by the 
German critical theory influenced literary historian Peter Bürger, who in his slim 1974 Theorie d'Avant-Garde book, translated into English in 1984, 84, argued that the avant-garde had been integrated into the institution of art after World War II. According to Bürger, the avant-garde had been a um, had been a full frontal attack on the art institution where groups like the Surrealist and Russian avant-garde had sought to give art a function outside the institution, integrating art into everyday life. Bürger persuasively argued for the necessity of distinguishing between modernism as a broader concept and the avant-garde as a description of the interwar attack on art. Following Benjamin, Bürger saw the avant-garde as a refusal of the organic artwork. The avant-garde constituted the self-critical phase of art, where artists recognized the institutional confinement of the autonomy of art and tried to subvert it by either ridiculing the norms and conventions of art or by putting art to use outside the art institution. The attack on the art institution, however, failed, Bürger argued, and after World War II, the transgressive gestures of the interwar avant-garde groups were repeated by what Bürger dismissingly called the new avant-garde inside the institution. Bürger had nothing but contempt for this phenomenon and wrote that the new avant-garde was nothing but the partial repetition of the heroic, heroic efforts of the historical avant-garde after the Second World War. While Bürger lamented the integration of the avant-garde and its radical gesture, Krauss was happy to bid farewell to the avant-garde and its idea of originality. But they agreed that the avant-garde was a thing of the past, that it was no longer present as a gesture in art. For Bürger, it disappeared with World War II. For Krauss, it was made obsolete by the representational critique of postmodernist art in the 80s. Both accounts were narrowly art historical. Neither had much to say about the broader historical context of modern art in the 20th century, both Krauss and Bürger preferred to argue for the disappearance of the avant-garde as, as a result of artistic and art institutional developments. This is a general problem with analysis of the avant-garde. Most of them are, so to say, not up to the task of the avant-garde and its problematization of the category of art, but prefer to remain firmly within a fairly limited art historical framework where the trajectory of the avant-garde is narrated as a development that takes place within the field of art in an narrow Bourdieuian sense. It's difficult to find more materialist accounts of the tra trajectory of the avant-garde, but one such analysis was made by the Italian workerist ar architectural historian Manfredo Sefuri, who in Progetto e Utopia from 1973 badly translated as Architecture and Utopia in 1976, argued that the avant-garde had been unable to transcend the structures that determined it. The artistic and architectural avant-garde had been a tragic artistic attempt to control the negative forces of capitalist society as if it is possible to plan and master the negativity of modernity. Capitalist modernity was characterized by anxiety to four argued following Simmel, Benjamin, and Massimo Cacciai, and the avant-garde tried to dispel that anxiety by internal, internalizing it and giving it form, coming up with plans, schemes, and programs articulated in the enormous amount of manifestos written by the different avant-garde groups. This, according to Tefoy, amounted to an illusion of mastery, as if the individual artwork or the provocative emptying out of the artistic gesture could somehow rise to the level of the system. Tefoy's ideology critical analysis embedded the avant-garde in a much broader historical context, but he nonetheless came to the same conclusion as Bürger and Krauss. The avant-garde was dead and gone. For Tefoy, the avant-garde represented the most radical self-critique of bourgeois society, an attempt to inhibit inhabit and use the ruthless destructive forces of industrial capitalism. But it remained an ideological expression of the fundamental contradictions of bourgeois society 
and was unable to solve that contradiction as art or as anti-art. Although the general sense is that the avant-garde is a thing of the past, or at least has been replaced by first a new avant-garde and since a post-new avant-garde, were both a displacement more than a continuation of the historical avant-garde, there have of course been different attempts to revive the notion of avant-garde. One of the most influential ones has been US critic and second generation October editor Al Foster, who in the mid-1990s leveled a severe critique at Burger's dismissal of the post-World War II new avant-garde. Foster critique Burger's rather one-dimensional endist account of art historical development where things occur once, arguing that is Foster, arguing that the attack on the institution of art only became recognizable with the repetition in a kind of Freudian afterwardness. According to Foster, the new avant-garde were not only engaged in a critical analysis of the institutional nexus, but also a discussion of the ongoing institutionalization of the avant-garde itself. Foster tried to create a position between Burger's avant-garde and Krauss's postmodernist art, between the critical theory of Burger and the post-structuralism of Krauss, and he argued that the new avant-garde practices, such as conceptual art, made visible and critiqued artistic conventions and historical conditions. Foster's critique of Burger was very re relevant and pointed to the complex temporality of modern art, but it ended up dissolving the very distinction between modernism and avant-garde introduced by, by Burger, thereby emptying the notion of avant-garde or making it so broad, Foster, that most contemporary art that is almost always already institutionally aware and meet meter discursive could be described as avant-garde. The self-critical character of the avant-garde was thus drastically reduced by Foster, who emphasized self-reflectiveness, self but let go of self-negation in the more transgressive gesture of the avant-garde. In many ways, Foster's argument for an open-ended notion of avant-garde is spot on as an analysis of the historical development from today, from a perspective of today. And it could be argued that contemporary art has indeed internalized the avant-garde attack on the organic artwork by becoming an interdisciplinary and multifarious post-object praxis. The painterly modernist art object done by the artist's genius has been replaced by an open-ended research practice or micro-social practice. But it's important to note that this inter internalization comes at a great cost and seriously diminishes the avant-garde project. Contemporary art as a kind of post-post-new avant-garde might very well be an expanded art practice in the sense of the demercialization of art met by, for instance, Lucy Lippert in the early 1970s but it remains undoubtedly art that carries its institutional framework wherever it goes, as a, among others, Andrea Fraser has noted repeatedly. And even more importantly, it has definitely lost any direct connection to an extra artistic revolutionary movement. In other words, art has become or is disconnected from the revolutionary practices the interwar avant-garde were part and parcel of and without which the avant-garde does not make sense. There's a reason the surrealist choose, chose to title their journal first La Révolution Surréaliste and then Le Surréalisme au service de la Révolution. Since the mid-1990s, there have been different attempts to conceptualize a more directly involved art on the rubrics or descriptions such as activist art, interventionist art, socially engaged art, textual media, but all of them fall flat compared to the engagement of the avant-garde. They're all part of what I've previously described as the art of modest proposals. This is an art in different ways, this, that, that is an art that in different ways tries to come up with solutions to concrete problems, such as the trampoline house, in Copenhagen, for instance, uh, a space for asylum seekers living in Danish refuge camps. But this art of modest proposals 
refrains from engaging in more utopian acts, preferring to alleviate present social issues. The abandonment of a more radical gesture, what we could call the great refusal with Herbert Marcuse or Maurice Blanchot, this abandonment is not the fault of the artists or the art theoreticians that try to advance these interventionist art practices as such, but of course has to do with the longer historical development characterized by the gradual dismantling of a previous existing leftist vocabulary and praxis to which the avant-garde was related or was one expression. That is, the disappearance of the revolution, to put it short. This is, of course, a huge topic that I'm not able to account for in any detailed manner whatsoever, but we can say that the period from the early 1980s has been one characterized by the com almost complete dissolution of an anti-capitalist perspective in any practical sense. This is the historical context for the modest proposals of the socially engaged art of today. The point, of course, being that the avant-garde was oriented towards and engaged in the first communist assault on capitalism that swept through the world in the years from 1917 to 1921, but lived on until the late 1930s as a real threat and a perspective one could orient oneself after. The counter-revolutionary response in the form of fascism, anti-fascism and Stalinism crashed the revolutionary upheavals and although the revolution did not completely disappear after World War II, as we can see with groups like the Situationists in the 60s, and it made a partial comeback in the global May 68, it was turned into a promise of selective access to commodities and political rights during the post-war economic boom. This is the story of the integration of the Western working class movement this is the story of the integration of the Western working class movement into the social state of, of Western capitalist society, where the local workers gained access to education, education, housing, culture and consumption, but in the process let go of more radical demands connected to a vision of a global, equal, post-capitalist distribution. Through a tremendous pressure from both the organized working class movement and especially its wild undercurrents. Bourgeois society ended up granting workers and other subaltern political subjects, granted them political rights, integrating them into the modern nation state, at least in the Western world, to some extent in, in, uh, in, the, in the Second World. The other side of this process, what Jeff Ely writes about as the forging of democracy, was of course the ongoing exclusion and racialization of other subaltern subjects that were not allowed to enter the nation state as subjects or political subjects or wage laborers. Du Bois talks about this as democratic despotism, the fact that the democratization of the white working class took place at the expense of people racialized black or non-white at home and abroad. With the establishment of the post-war social state in the West, the revolution was replaced by what Negri calls the Fordist wage productivity compromise. If we fast forward, we can say that the period since the early 1970s has been one characterized by the ruthless response to the partial rediscovery of the revolution in the global May 68. That is, the gradual dismantling of the post-war welfare society and concerted efforts to socialize the cost of a shrinking economy in the West. This is what we often talk about as neoliberalism, an economic paradigm, but also a particular culture where the political horizon is closed down and the revolution is at best a description of microelectronic innovations put at the disposal of eager consumers. We know this history within cultural studies and art theory as a question of the spectacle or postmodernism in Jameson's use of the term. That is, the discussion about the disappearance of the last vestiges of resistance to late capitalist mass culture the process where the last overlooked parts of everyday life, idiosyncratic speech patterns, local forms of solidarity and resistant lifestyles um, 
together constituting what James C. Scott calls infrapolitics, where they are all subsumed to the demands of the market. Jameson has recently talked about postmodernism as the time of the curator. As someone who has a recipe for producing events in the institution for the now. In the institution now, for Jameson, of course, meaning that there's no historical dimension whatsoever in the art institution. And that there's no outside to the institution. The institution being the natural habitat for any artistic gesture, however critical it's intended. The British art historian John Roberts has recently warned against undialectical, misanthropic, misanthropic readings of the integration of art into mass culture, such as Jameson's, arguing that modern art has always been under pressure. Of course, we have to keep the most doom-like readings at bay, highlighting the way the art institution has in fact functioned as a substitute political public sphere in a period in which the neoliberal ideology has tended to remove any reference to a world outside capital accumulation. The art institution has been a place for presentations of political conflicts, a space where discussions of crisis in communities, for instance, have taken place. Robert's argument is less concerned with the repurpose, repurposing of the art institution, and he puts forth an Adornian argument about the continued self-critique of the artwork. Roberts tries to conceptualize this as a third or suspensive avant-garde that upholds and expands the continuing labor of negation on the category of art and the institutions of capitalist society. These are his, his words. It's a suspensive avant-garde because it continues art's labor of negation in historically uh, on proportionate circumstances, trying to sustain art's independence within capitalist society. The artwork tries to resist, resist its own exchange value and market visibility. Robert's stress on the real complexity of the autonomy of art is super relevant, but Robert en ends up internalizing the spectacle leaving him with a very reduced idea of opposition. His third avant-garde is very much an avant-garde after, in the sense of lacking the revolutionary dimension that was so central in previous avant-gardes. The inclusion of art external material into the artwork has become the very definition of contemporary art. And Roberts ends up in a similar position as Foster, where the avant-garde has lost any connection to radical politics. It's telling that Robert starts out by defining the third avant-garde as negating both the category of art and the institutions of capitalist society, but quickly lets go of the last part of the critique, institutions of capitalist society, thus seriously downscaling the avant-garde perspective. So Robert paradoxically ends up in a position where the avant-garde is doomed to endlessly negate itself as art forever unable to exit the art institutions. But what if the avant-garde has already, in fact, left the institution of art? What if the avant-garde did indeed die as an artistic or anti-artistic gesture, but was translated into a destituent gesture outside the institution of art? From the creative autonomist, Autonomia Creativa, in the 1977 movement in Italy, to the, invisible today, to the invisible committee today, the iconoclastic gesture of the avant-garde has in fact been present all along, but in a displaced way, outside the institutional confinements of art, expressing itself in moments of upheaval and insurrection. It's important to understand that this is not the avant-garde becoming social movements. The vocabulary of social movements, both social movement studies and social movements themselves, tend to subscribe to the social division that the avant-garde aims at attacking. The de-differentiation of capitalist modernity, where artists, activists, and academics, each in their separate, each are, are, are active, each in their separate sphere. 
A fundamental insight of the avant-garde is the critique of the specialized identities of capitalist modernity, be it the identity and practice of the artist or the identity of the activist. It is in that sense the avant-garde was an attempt to integrate art and everyday life, transgressing the relative autonomous spheres of Catholic society with a view to not only creating a new society, but immediately living a different life, communizing existence. The Situationist International is the obvious starting point for this history of this endeavor. The Situationist is both the end point of the avant-garde but also the starting point for a different post-artistic avant-garde, what I would propose to name the destituent avant-garde. Destituent because it's neither questioning, it's, it's, uh, it is neither questioning, it's neither a question of realizing an already described artistic political program, nor a question of replacing one order with a new one but more a question of saving the already existing world and liberating it from the abstract logic of capital accumulation and the violence of the state. In the terms of Walter Benjamin, it's a question of deposing or displacing the state. Destitution, in Setzung in German, the unmaking of the instituted. This after avant-garde is without a program. For a long period in the 20th century, the program for Leninist and Socialist alike was the socialization of production. But this after avant-garde is without a program. Um, <clears throat> it's not a question of making something real as if it does not already exist. Uh, the destituent avant-garde abandons the idea of realizing an ideal in an act. And as such, there's no program to be put into practice. It's no longer a question of carrying out a series of acts or deeds that follow and confirm a communist program. The project consists in making power unworkable, making it impossible for politics to function, making it unable to reproduce its laws. Unlike the old avant-garde, the new destituent avant-garde does not transgress the laws and oppose the state, it withdraws from them. It's no longer a question of critiquing or destroying the existing laws with a view to establishing a new one. The project is much more the project is a much more complex operation whereby the law is suspended, made unreal, whereby it becomes impossible to follow the law as well as break the law. So my argument is that the avant-garde did indeed disappear as an artistic, anti-artistic gesture connected to the institution of art. But it continued elsewhere, outside the institution of art, as a creative, capital negating gesture that unites revolutionary discipline and the ecstatic intoxication of the revolt. This after avant-garde would be an avant-garde that is an avant-garde as not an avant-garde that turns its back on the future and strives to exit, refusing to realize the potential, refusing to give form to a new community, but emptying state power and ending the deadly dialectic between law and violence. The situationist Michel Bernstein gave us a good idea of this after avant-garde and its take on history with her contribution to the manifestation destruction of RC6 took place in 1963 in a small gallery called Gallery Exi in Odense in Denmark a gallery located in, in the cellar of, of the first um, squad uh, in Denmark that also lost uh, half the the, the local chapter of uh, the chapter of the local C and D movement. The situationist wanted to expand the critique present uh, in the C and D and the anti-nuclear movement and give it a revolutionary direction. One and a half month prior to the manifestation in Odense, British activists calling, them, calling themselves spies for peace 
had broken into a secret nuclear bunker complex in Reading, exposing the British government's plans in case of nuclear war. The situation is used the ensuring scandal as a starting point for their project, turning the art gallery into a shelter. As part of the project, Bernstein showed a series of, of paintings, perhaps we can call them, titled Victories of the Proletariat. Pictures depicting historical battle scenes where the proletariat had lost to counter-revolutionary forces. In Bernstein's rendering, things were turned upside down, and the proletariat suddenly emerged as the victor. Victory of the Commune of Paris, victory of the Spanish Republic. On a formal level, the paintings were unpretentious or hastily made, composed of plaster, with toy soldiers or plastic tanks pressed into the surface and paint splashed on top. Bernstein was repeating the adventures of the communards and the Spanish Republicans, not as an act of nostalgia, but as an attempt to render the past possible again, one that restores these lost possibilities of anti-capitalist negation. In the radical gesture of disavowal, Bernstein opposes the postcard time of the spectacle with a self-conscious creation of history. History is suddenly opened up, and what is, is haunted by what might be. This is not a nostalgic gesture where Bernstein wants to return to the past, but a radical gesture that is explicitly striving to highlight the dialectic of revolution and counter-revolution. A gesture that strives to turn both history and the present into an open-ended battlefield of class war. Victories of the proletariat is not, it's not the return of the identical, of the historical facts of the proletarian experiences and defeats. It's the return of the possibility of what was. It's a making the past possible again. By showing us the historical defeats of the proletarian victories, Bernstein makes them possible again. We have the same situation with the same antagonists, but yet completely different. The point being that everything is possible even the horrors of the spectacular commodity society, but of course also something different, namely another world. Thanks.